Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you guys for hearing me. Thank you guys for sitting around. Traffic. Uh, can you guys hear me okay at the back? No. Anyway, to me. I'm fed up. Can you luck any better? There we go. Can you hear me now? Better. Um, so yeah, my name is Michi van Staten. I'm the managing director at a company called Obsidian. Uh, Carl mentioned it in uh, his talk. Uh, we started back in 1995. A bunch of engineering students at the old Grand Afrikaans University. Uh, we got tired of buying hardware from other people. So we decided uh, let's uh, start a company and sell hardware rather than buying it from other people. And uh, one of the guys discovered Linux. That's just pretty cool stuff. Um, we didn't know that we could make money out of it, and how we're going to make money out of it, until one of the professors called us saying he's got a problem with one of his Unix boxes. Uh, one of the guys went in, had a look, fixed it, and as he walked out, the police said, uh, please send me your invoice. And we were like, what? We could actually charge people the money for shit. So, uh, um, and back in 1995, you can imagine not a lot of people knew about open source. Uh, we spent an enormous amount of time just educating them. You know, is this stuff safe? Is it secure? How can it be secure if everybody can see the code? So uh, back then we already said to people, just give it 20 years and everybody's going to run this. It's going to run the world. And people thought we were a little bit crazy. But I think we're starting to show that uh, we were sort of right. Um, so uh, we were lucky enough, you know, working at a university, we had access to the internet. Not a lot of people did in the, in the 90s, late 90s. So uh, I even remember when we got our first cell phones, they didn't look like that, luckily. But uh, it's a long, long time ago. Our first big break came in 1997 with uh, guys that you probably know the logo. So the guys at Nando's uh, had a problem. They had some very expensive Unix equipment, uh, and they were looking for uh, a cheaper and probably more reliable solution. We convinced them, and uh, I'm still not sure why, but they went out on a limb. And we deployed a Linux box in every Nando store in South Africa. We had a team of guys driving literally from one Nando's to the other. They were sick and tired of chicken at the end of it. But uh, we put a Linux box in every Nando store. So they were probably one of the first companies in this country that could say they were really seriously using Linux in a production environment. I don't know if they still run it. Uh, we parted ways over the years, but uh, it was fun. Then uh, in 1999, so uh, before this, we kind of made our money uh, providing consulting around open source. Uh, we started doing our own Linux training. Uh, and we very quickly realized that people preferred to have a vendor behind the, the, the training that we did. So we sent two guys uh, to Europe, and they came back. And we were the first uh, Red Hat training partner in South Africa. So uh, it was a lot of fun. And in those guys, days, if you sold Red Hat, it was literally a box with some stuffy in it, maybe a t-shirt and a cap. Not nearly the stuff that we sell today. So uh, that is honestly how we made our money back then. In 2001, I think Red Hat uh, shocked the world with the release of Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Suddenly decided to say, well, here's something different. There's a community version, there's an enterprise version, and we're going to start charging enterprise money for it. Um, we heard things like, what, are they becoming like Microsoft, etc. Don't worry, I'll punch you guys later, Microsoft. Um, and it shocked the world. How do we now charge for something that is free and community? And uh, during that time, I read a thing that was written by a guy called James Dixon. At that stage, he was the CIO of a company called Pentaho. Uh, they're now part of Itachi. They do uh, BI and uh, ESB in the big data space. And he wrote a whole thing on the beekeeper. What the hell does that mean and what it's going to do with open source? And he used the analogy that uh, if you look at bees, bees are the only creatures that can make honey. They're really good at it. And that's the only thing they do. You can go to a beehive and say, here's a hundred bucks. I want you to put your honey in a jar and put a label on it. It's something that the bees fundamentally don't understand. No matter times how many say it, what language, the bees just don't understand it. All they want to do is make honey. That's the open source community. All they want to do is code. They want to fix problems. They don't want to write documentation. They don't want to backport bugs. Right? So how do we solve this in the bee world? You have a beekeeper. They keep the honey hive. 
nice, the beehive nice and healthy, make sure that the bees have a place to thrive. But they take the money that people pay them for the bottled honey. And that's why you have companies like Red Ant, Seuss, a whole bunch of other guys. Why do you need them? They're there to protect the community, to fund the community, but they make money. They're also there to understand what business needs are, because the bees don't. And that fundamentally is why you have community open source and you have enterprise open source. And it's honestly in the 23 years of doing this, the best analogy that I've ever heard about why these things work, etc. So if you're interested, just go James Dixon, beekeeper. There's a short version and there's a really long version that goes into the benefits of open source uh, development versus proprietary, really worth the read. And I mean, Linux is pretty much the poster child of open source. But if we think about where we are today with things like Docker, OpenStack, Hadoop, Spark, open source has changed the way the world works, fundamentally. Uh, and for us, having been doing this so long, uh, we've seen things pop up in the open source community that we never thought were possible. I mean, if you just think of something like Android, where it's running, TVs, watches, everywhere, and it all comes out of open source. It is really, really an amazing methodology. What we always try to tell people is uh, open source is not a religion. It's very important that people understand it. It's a development model. It's all about how do we develop software together and get the best out of it. So yeah, I never thought I'd be standing on a stage talking about open source, uh, open source and uh, with our friends at Microsoft. Boy, they've changed. Um, I can remember 15 years ago, I would use them as uh, you know, the antithesis of what you shouldn't be doing. I use the example of, uh, if you look at a, an Oracle database, it's proprietary, but at least it runs on Windows and it runs on Linux, it gives you choice. Microsoft, look at their SQL database, it only runs on Windows. That's an example of bad technology, irrespective of its proprietary open source. Where are we today? Now you can run that same database on pretty much any OS. So for us, it's amazing to see an organization like Microsoft and how they have embraced open source. I mean, they are a massive contributor now to, to Linux, to Kubernetes, to a whole bunch of stuff, stuff that we never thought we would see. So I was lucky enough, uh, I think it was January last year, uh, to actually spend two days with the Microsoft executives um, just to hear how these guys see the world. Uh, and there was one thing that really stuck with me and they said they better look at, at IT over the last couple of decades. And they realized that every decade there's a fundamental technology that changes the way we do things. And usually in during that decade you can start seeing hints of what's coming next. And they used the example it was first mainframe. Mainframe was replaced by client server. Client server was replaced by the World Wide Web. World Wide Web replaced by mobile. They admit they missed mobile. So very angry with themselves, but they said if we follow that trend, we should now be able to start seeing what is going to be the big disruptor for the next decade. And in their view, it's going to be the Internet of Things, artificial intelligence, and augmented reality. And with that they mean, I mean all of us have cell phones, and they go, why is it the size it is? It's two things to be it's the battery and the screen. If we can change those fundamentally, our cell phones can be a lot smaller. They envisage the world where nothing is a screen, anything is a screen. So I think the challenge for all of us, and it challenged me as well as you know, if we go into a world like that, where everything is literally connected, screens can be anything and everywhere, and we have artificial intelligence where the machines can give us answers quicker than what we could probably think of the questions. Where does it leave all of us? What do we need to know from a technology point? How is it going to change the world where we, where we live? So that's just some of the stuff that I thought I'd come and share with you guys. Another interesting thing that's happening in the world is a thing that's called the gig economy. So just like a band that does a gig, people are starting to realize that it's not necessarily about an employer-employee relationship anymore. A lot of people are saying, well, I'd rather get you to do a specific gig for me. Here's a, a WordPress site that's an example. Please build it for me and design it for me, and the gig is done. You don't get any employee benefits, etc. But this is maybe something to keep an eye on. There's a whole movement in the world around that. And once again, you know, for us, our children, what is it going to be there? Are they going to work for big organizations, or are they effectively going to be working for themselves and just look for the next technology gig? Key things for us for the world going forward: 
everything has code. All ancient, uh, again, a lot of people refer to data centers, infrastructure as well. And I think the simple reality is the world that we are going towards is everything is going to be code. You're not going to click and drag stuff, you're going to code it, you're going to put it in some source repository, and that's how we're going to spin up all of our tech. Another key thing that I'd like to share with you guys is just think about this. I hope you all agree that change has never been this fast. I mean, I'm struggling to just keep pace of all the technologies that we work with, what's coming up next. But the scary thing is, it'll never be this slow again. It's just going to get faster and faster. Change. So, uh, I hope you guys enjoyed it. I don't know if anybody has any questions. I'm going to pass it over to Ross. Ross is from Red Hat, and he's got some interesting things to share with you guys. Yes, Obsidian is hiring. celebrating 20 years in the Linux industry as such. I was actually introduced to Linux by Obsidian. Um, I was uh, doing a course many years ago uh, at the high school I went to as a diploma. Obsidian guys walked in one day and uh, most of the guys really were, were there. I won't say which school it is, it's quite controversial at the moment. But most of them uh, uh, left, the, left the room because there was a guy by the name of Anton Devet and he had like really funky hair. He was quite a different guy. And they just left and left me alone. And what blew my mind, what started me on Linux was that Anton telnetted out of a Linux server that we were running at the school into an MWeb server running Solaris across the internet. And that blew my mind. And then that was it. I was completely sold. Simple thing, telnet. Right now things have changed. So, <clears throat> I got into Linux 99 more seriously, um, and I've been doing it ever since. And I've done some crazy things that maybe I shouldn't have, and some things that I've actually learned along the way. So, just in case, I think we pretty much can say Linux has won in a lot of ways when we're running this sort of critical infrastructure. I mean, even in this country, the customers I speak to on a daily basis um, it's quite amazing how it's come from, do you want a mail server maybe, so to, um, you know, we're talking to banks about core banking systems and trading platforms, and we're talking to airlines and telcos. If Red Hat, just Red Hat systems went down today, South Africa would come to a halt. So, we pretty much, yes, Linux is pretty critical to the global economy right now, and Red Hat plays a part. There are others. But anyway, where I started and where, what I want to uh, impart today is um, after a couple of years of doing IT support, um, the only way to actually make any sort of money was supporting uh, Windows desktops, essentially. And being a Linux guy supporting Windows desktops is a rather painful experience because they just kept breaking and I was frustrated. For me to find a job within the Linux community was quite hard. Obsidian wouldn't employ me at the time because I only knew uh, Windows or something like that. And I started this idea. I was part of the Karting Linux user group. I eventually became the chairman of the Karting Linux user group. And a couple of us decided that would be a good idea to make a South African Linux distribution. These sort of geographic Linux distributions were slightly popular at the time. Chinese had one, et cetera, et cetera, one in Brazil. So <clears throat> that's what we decided to do. My primary motivation is, one, I actually wanted to make a living out of the technology I love, open source and Linux. I wanted to prove that we can do it, that it can be done by some South Africans. And I was tired of funding my Linux habit by supporting Windows. I wanted to actually get 
pay for what I love doing. <coughs> so I started with some other people, I don't know if you've ever heard of it, something called MP Linux. Anyone heard of it? Oh, I'm so sorry. No. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty crazy. It was, if you've ever watched uh, Silicon Valley, that... Uh, Um, uh, of that series. <laughs> okay, every time I smile, I won't smile. Uh, that makes pops, crackles. So every time, um, so, so I was watching Silicon Valley and they go, So if you watched Silicon Valley, <coughs> they've got that real startup culture, and I sat there and I watched it, and it was, was someone recording me at the time, and they put it into the script. You do crazy things when you're a startup, trust me. So this is MP Linux. So here's, here's we started the first commercial, well, first South African distribution with commercial aspirations. There were other distributions and universities, and, but it was well known, relatively well known, and we wanted to actually make some money out of Linux. We built our own one from scratch, didn't use anyone else's package manager. The original, original one was Debian, then we went to our own one. Um, and in that time, I had some interactions with uh, Mark Shuttleworth, and he went and did, he wanted us to build a Debian-based South African distribution, and we said no, because uh, we're building our own. And he went and off, off and did Ubuntu, and yes. We know what happened there. Um, and uh, so MP Linux had a strange relationship. It was probably a bad idea at the time, but we're getting some traction in the South African government. Now, the South African government was light years ahead of all other governments at the time. We had open source policies, we were going head first, and then I don't know what happened. But anyway, we had lots of government contacts. I spent months of my life in Pretoria doing strange POCs on MP Linux. So we went to Mark and said, let's try and make a commercially viable Ubuntu-based distribution that's applicable to the South African government. We won tenders, etc., etc." He <coughs> bought MP Linux for 10 million rand. I don't know if you know, Mark Shuttleworth owned another Linux distribution. He bought for 10 million rand and we went and we started getting traction, it was a bit slow, it was the wrong thing to do. By the end of about three years, <coughs> uh, Mark sold it, uh, well through his, his venture capital firm, here be Dragons, to Business Connection. So Business Connection, anyone from Business Connection? Thank goodness. Uh, actually owned EP Linux for a, a time. I sort of left, I thought, nah, not my thing, I went and did some work in government where I sorted out rail systems, I went to Siemens. But what we came to at the end of that three years is, no, the world doesn't need a South African Linux distribution. No, we don't have to sell another Linux distribution. There's a lot of other guys doing it, doing it better. This is the whole team of MP Linux. There's one person missing. 10 million bucks in our back pocket, not quite, but we were gonna go and change the world. Against Microsoft, meh, whatever. Red Hat, meh, losers. They were doing this enterprise thing, uh, etc. cetera, Novell, Susie. That, that, that was the whole team. So <laughs> that was going to change the world. Smaller teams have done more, but anyway. At the end of the, t <clears throat> of the time, where we were actually getting traction and understanding what people actually wanted were services, right? In the open source world, the way to make money is essentially you deliver a service. Take Obsidian. And look at Red Hat. Red Hat does services. We don't sell software. We actually deliver subscriptions. Subscriptions are subscribing to our services, not, not the software. You get entitled to the software. It feels like a license, etc. There's a, a point I'll come to in that. And that is why we went over to Business Connection, because they're a services company, essentially. 
So that's an important learning that we, we started learning is, yes, you cannot sell open source software. It is the services backing. In this country, there's more of a requirement <coughs> for people, for companies, for governments, etc., to have people behind the keyboard to actually do the work than having someone with the Red Hat or the Suzy type of model of that third, that higher level support, or subscribing to that support. And that's why I'm really happy, happy to be here today. Is we talk, I'm talking to the guys who are, have the skills. Most of you are talking to somebody today, very skilled people. You're able to provide those services that we need in this country, not the higher level stuff that the big distributions do. So you're in a great position. <clears throat> so that's the MP Linux team. This is it for me now. And I work for Red Hat, it's a pretty much a global company. Um, more than 13,000 employees, 36 countries, and it's the first open source company to reach 2 billion. And if you look at our latest filings, yes, we uh, listed on the New York Stock Exchange, which has its benefits and problems, but we're on track to be the first $3 billion open source company. I know Microsoft's standing there going, whatever. But uh, <laughs> you were there once. So this is quite an achievement. You must admit, it is an achievement to get to this sort of size as an open source company. But we're not exactly an open source company and tell you where Red Hat fits in. If you listen to some of our guys um, in the States, whatever, the big honchos, we're an enterprise software company with an open source development model. That's where we start changing things. That's where Red Hat focuses. It's the enterprise. It's as this slide showed. Big banks, telcos, airlines, healthcare, uh, government. <coughs> that is what differentiates. It's a very different place to MP Linux, for instance. If I knew now what I did then, would I have done MP Linux? Probably not. I would have been a lot more successful. Done an obsidian or something like that. <laughs> so this is, this is where we, we are right now. <coughs> um, so just in the open source world, uh, I know actually I do get it from time to time, is I get these nasty looks or swear words about Red Hat and we just take from the open source community and we just package it and we make money out of all other people's hard work. That's not exactly the case. <clears throat> you can see it in some of our, um, our, our quarterly reports is roughly between 12 and 20% of Red Hat's revenue goes into open source software in general. That's a lot of stuff from the kernel, Kubernetes, you name it. Two Red Hat employees are employed on the Debian project. Okay, basically it's to keep some compatibility between Debian, but Red Hat employs two Debian developers. Bet you didn't know that. So we highly entrenched. We do a lot of stuff in the open source community. This is what our model looks like. You can recognize some of those things, some technologies that you love or hate or whatever, but that's how, the, that's how the business model works with Red Hat. We contribute, we fund sometimes these open source communities. Often we buy proprietary companies. Ansible was slightly proprietary when we bought it. Cloudforms, which was used to manage IQ, for millions of dollars. And then we take this proprietary code, I think Ansible was $140, 000, uh, $140 million, or something like that. Don't quote me on that. And we open source everything. That's pretty crazy. So <clears throat> everything we do is open source. If it's not there, we will make the community. We will fund it. We will build it up so that more people can contribute. That's how we do. Everything is open source. Even today, I think if you get RHEL 3, you still can't play an MP3 on RHEL, oh, RHEL 7, sorry, an MP3 on RHEL 7. Because until very recently, the codecs were proprietary, so they did not go into RHEL we've stuck to that. There's never been a piece of proprietary code inside of Red Hat. Everything is open source. Some of our offerings, where it's customer data, if you've ever used Red Hat Insights, it's using our analytics platform for predictive analy analytics and, and fault tolerant, uh, fault finding, <coughs> you'll find that it's customer data and we don't open source our customer data, but everything around it, it's open source. So, <laughs> this is something that I learned student, no money. 
I could get hold of the technology where it was almost impossible to get hold of in any of the other proprietary ways. And part of the, I won't say MP was ever sort of a failure, I learned a lot, so that's great, um, is we could never move it from talking as MP Linux, be like, man, it's Linux, it's cool, it's free, it's stable, um, and actually start getting more of a following than a couple of people downloading it. We had it in magazines and stuff like that. And yeah, so, so it, partly of this, this understanding of it came only when I started at Red Hat. And if you don't build value into the whole chain, no one else is going to be interested. Unfortunately, we love Linux, we love open source, but if you want to get someone else, another company, or employ someone to promote it, if there's no value, if they can't make anything out of it, they're not going to do it. Not everyone is passionate just about this technology, and you need those other people. So Red Hat, like pretty much you know, every other vendor, we go through a channel, and there's a good reason for it. Yes, we're doing services, so we're you know, how does this work? You must remember what we do with Red Hat is we package our services that are consumable by larger enterprises. I mean, as I said, with MP Linux, I was happy if I could help you move off Windows. Okay. Now, we talk, I'm talking to people setting up core banking and how they do that. So we made a model, very interesting model, that allows someone like a big bank, they're stuck in their ways, their pro procurement wor works in certain ways, and there's no way you're going to change that, open source or not, you're not going to win. We now package subscriptions, which two procurement people feel like licenses, so they're happy. They call it licenses, we're like, it's really very different, we're not giving you a license to the software, it's a subscription, just call it licenses, it's easier. Yes, it's licenses. Okay. In that, with the, invent, invent, uh, the, the advent of Red Hat Enterprise Linux and the Red Hat subscription model, we could do that. Yes, we char started charging enterprise money or RHEL. Okay? Now, just before this happened, I, I learned this very recently, I knew some of it, that before Red Hat Enterprise Linux, Red Hat almost went under. We were selling some mugs and t-shirts on the website, and the software came in box sets at $39 a box set. Overnight, we went from $39 a box set to $2,000 a subscription, and everyone said, you're nuts, you're going out of business. And we at least, well, we're sitting here today, two billion revenue a year, at least. So suddenly, yes, we could actually start investing in open source Properly. We could buy proprietary companies and open source it. But we could build something where there's a value chain in that. We could now have a distribution. We could go from, so I don't know if how it works, there's the vendor like Red Hat, Oracle, Microsoft, you name it. It's very traditional. There's the vendor. It then goes through the distribution channel. There's a couple of distributors out there, and they, they do a lot of interesting work. They do uh, rate of exchange, uh, a lot of uh, our accounting, we, they sometimes a bank for us in a way, the partners. Uh, then it goes from the distributors, doing this bits of admin, and quoting in RAND, and then to a partner like Obsidian, for instance, or LSD. Suddenly, there was something, but he'll say there's actually a reason to get up in the morning and go and sell Red Hat because they get a piece of that that we can sell. There was value in that. We could add more value to the actual customers. It wasn't just small guys in the garage. Hey, Mr. Bank, don't you want to run our Linux? Get lost. Who are you? You six people. What happens if you die? We're not in. Actually, I never. Banks just told me nice idea, but yeah, we'll we'll stick to the big boys like IBM. So that is part of the value where Red Hat comes in. We get our partners every day <coughs> talking to a new customer or existing customer. They're building the Linux market in the enterprise where we mainly play. So we suddenly had that value. Another thing that I came up with is it's not value that money level and how people get money and how they get paid and, and the motivation behind it. But even when you go back to the nine, ten people at MP there, 
even getting what you need is it's great to be a, a technologist in open source and understanding it but there's a point where you're in your business I'm sure some of you who runs a business cool there's a point where and you may have been this down the open source road is everything about that business was this open source or your software whatever it was and eventually you need to actually employ someone to do something like accounting or marketing or sales. Most of those people are not passionate about the technology. Sales people are passionate about selling. I know a lot of people are like, ah, sales people, ugh. it's actually a very difficult job. You need to be a certain type of person for that. Marketing people, same thing. We've got a marketing um, lady, Rita. She's amazing. What she knows about the technology? Not that much. She knows enough to make really great events, okay? And do press and all that sort of stuff. It's a different type of profession, it's a different type of talent. If you're not building your business, you need those people to grow. But if you stick in the technology, you stick in this open source and everything, and your world revolves around it, I came from there, you're never going to attract those sort of people. I remember at MP trying to get, we just started with a PA coming in or a secretary or whatever you want to call it, and putting, I think it was MP Linux desktop on there. And like, yeah, use it, it's cool, don't you think it's, no, she, she used Windows. And honestly, it would be better if we just let her use Windows, carry on with the job and do the value that she adds, and you carry on with the software and the value that you add. So, there's a ton of other stuff, I have no more slides, in that building, you know, building your businesses, building your open source um, is, it's, it's something that I often get, uh, it, it frustrates me sometimes, and it's not everyone is aware of it, is always sort of understand your business, what you're in. I go to a bank, I'm talking to technologists, and this happens, some of them start asking me about, I'm talking about OpenShift, why are we using this version of Docker? Not what the value is to that business and how it can deliver to customers, it's very frustrating. So, as technologists, keep in mind, Always keep in mind what you're actually selling at the end of the day. What pays your paychecks? Okay? If you're generating your own paychecks, it's great. You need to market yourself. You need to understand that world. So it's great to be that and stay with that. But don't put blinkers onto the rest of the way the world works and you know, make make your life a bit better. Get some more money. Keep that in mind. That's just my takeaway that I can give to you. I know some of you have got it. If you're running businesses, I mean, the Yaku have been running for like years already, Obsidian, they've got it, okay? Often I speak to guys in very frustrating situations. Amazingly intelligent, just when it comes to business, either they need to understand that world a little bit more, or they need to bring someone else on board who can help them go forward. So I keep that in mind. That's one of the biggest learnings that I, I looked at. And that's pretty much all I have to say about that.